Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas. We do post every week, so hit the subscription button and the bell notification if you want to know exactly what we're up to every week. Stephen, I can't help but thinking <laughs> we're mm. by a compost heap. <laughs> we, we are indeed. Why? Well, the idea today is yeah. to talk about how I create a garden that I see as largely sustainable. So we're going to talk about the different aspects of a sustainable garden. And this is very interesting because ever since I've come to your garden, I've been very lucky to see it over many years, that notion I've accepted but never actually asked you about specifically. Mm. So it's going to be great to go through all the different things that you do mm. to make your garden sustainable. Yeah. And some of these things may or may not be things that other people can do, but as long as you select some things out that you see as doable in your own particular environment, we'll all have an impact on the environment as a whole. And we all can have a go in some description, whether you are a windowsill gardener or you have a grand estate like yourself, Mr. Ryan. Grand estate? Do you think grand estate? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, a modicum of gardening, yes. There we are. Yeah. Well, let us begin where we've begun, which is, ladies and gentlemen, the fetid, rotting compost heap. Yes, which of course is something that all keen gardeners like to discuss over dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. Yes. Uh, the constituents of one's compost heap. Now, I have compost pits. So I have three pits and I alternate as I go. So I have a largish garden as yep. we've alluded to. So I have three large pits, all of which are around about two meters by two meters. So yes. it's quite large for compost pits, but it suits my working load here in the garden. And we compost everything we can. Can I just stop you and ask you one question then? In yep. fact, many questions. Firstly, why three? Well, because you can alternate much more easily. You've got one empty or near enough to empty. You've got uh, one that's being rotted Fresh. down, freshish, and one that's sort of in the Halfway. midst of. So uh -huh. that way you can properly alternate them. So three is the optimum number, unless you have five, seven, 10, or 25 or something where you've got plenty of them going all the time. But three is sort of the minimum. And is it, am I observing this correctly? So they are just timber frames and yep. they are not sitting on concrete, they're sitting on the, on the earth? Oh yes, because that allows for the bacterium and the worms and things to transfer between. Right. So there's no reason you can't actually compost uh, on a, a hard surface, but I think it's desirable not to. Okay, so, well we go. will follow your advice. <laughs> Now, the other thing I've heard you mentioned and I have read is the notion of cold and hot compost. Mm. And I don't really think I understand what mm. the difference is. Is, oh. this, is this hot or cold? This Steve? is cold composting. Okay. I don't do hot composting because I have a life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's the difference? All right. Hot composting is all about having the right components in the right spot at the right moment and putting them all together so that you build up a lot of heat inside your compost heap. So the advantages of that yes. are that you get compost very quickly. Yes. And because of the heat of the compost pile, yeah. you tend to find that it will kill more weed seeds and other things. So you can it. put anything in it? Well, more or less. Yeah. Uh, there are always limits to these things. But anyhow, so hot composting though, you need to be on top of all the time. You need to have your ingredients at hand all the time. And, and that includes dry sort of nitrogen based things, yeah. like dry leaves or yeah. straw or... or... Yes, and it includes the softer uh, green things like lawn clippings, kitchen yeah. scraps and waste. Mm. So you need to have a balance of dry materials and sort of slightly soggy wet materials. And you need to have them in layers and you need to have them all in place at the right moment to create the hot composting. Right. Cold composting is another <laughs> kettle of fish. It sounds very, cold composting sounds easier. So the things that the tumblers that you see, is that a hot? Tends to be usually a hot composting type system. The tumblers are quite good if you've got a much smaller space that you're working yes, on. So, urban gardens. Yeah, I don't have an issue with those. And then, you know, the other is the compost bin, the sort of plastic bin with a lid on the top that you can compost in. I tend to find those sorts of systems though. One, well, the tumbler is time consuming, so yep. I haven't got the time to fiddle with one. And the compost bins just aren't big enough for my particular usage. There we go. Well, let's take a deep dive, yeah. which is not literal, into this compost heap. Why not? <laughs> Despite this being cold, I'm sensing warmth, warmth and yes. fecundity. <laughs> yeah. So it is a cold composting system, but of course, some heat does build up. Yeah but it's less likely to kill weed seeds and other sundry things. Yes. So if you're using cold 
created compost, the one thing you do have to be aware of is there's probably going to be seeds in it. So if you're putting it on the garden beds, then you probably need to mulch over the top to stop the seeds from actually germinating. Good point. Well, which brings me to the bigger question then of what do you put in here and what do you not put in here? All right. I put almost anything organic I can lay my hands on. Yeah. I don't put weedy bulbs into the compost because the Your bulbs will grow. Oxalis. Yes. If I dig those up, they, they're dealt with in another way. Which we will cover. Yes, which minute. we will cover. I don't put in things like like running cooch grasses and things like that because yep. again they will take root and grow yeah but almost anything else will go into the compost so most of my soft weedy material the perennials that I've cut down all of those things tend to go into the compost yeah and in my case I also use spent potting mix from my nursery which I can see yes there's and... a bit of that and yes any vegetable scraps I can get which includes not just my own so yes, tell our viewers this story because I think this is extraordinary. Yeah. Well, that the lengths you go to to, well, it's really a commitment to environmental, not creating environmental waste. Well, exactly. I, I see myself as a net green waste importer, um, is, is the way I put it. And what I do is I have a quick visit to the local little supermarket. Yep. We've got a nice little country supermarket here. And I go in there every evening. And when they've been going through their vegetables and discarding things they can't sell anymore because they've manky or they've broken or whatever yes. so i come home with all the scraps yeah and anything that the chickens could deal with first goes into the chicken uh, coop and yep. so the chickens and ducks will eat the lettuce leaves and other sundry things yep. and then they create compost of their own of course yes and everything else goes into the compost heap so yes uh, broken capsicums bent garlic you name it it all goes into the compost heap that's amazing uh, and i do that every evening so i bring all the stuff home from the supermarket sometimes i get a surfeit of overripe bananas or you it's amazing what stuff goes through even at a small supermarket that can't be sold but what a fantastic way of solving that problem by actually creating something very useful because i think i was reading that mulch and compost uh the carbon is still sequestered in this yeah. and then once it's turned into compost it's returned to the soil it becomes part of the nitrogen cycle once again mm. the plants absorb it so it's an incredibly useful thing to do now i guess you being in a small country town it's easier to develop those kind of relationships. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't I'm... imagine a big supermarket in a city is going to have a relationship with the local gardeners like I can build here. I might be wrong. But, but the perhaps other... small family owned businesses, you could certainly ask. Yeah, you certainly could ask. Uh, we get the coffee from the local cafe, the coffee grounds. We're going to get to coffee yeah. in a minute. So we bring home lots of stuff. We're very friendly with uh, some of the local tree surgeons and we regularly get truckloads of tree shreddings as well. So I wasn't kidding when I said we were net green waste importers. So we bring stuff in. So virtually nothing leaves our property that is organic. Great philosophy. Well, that pepper can go back on the pile. Oops. Um, how long stage by stage? So in this area, you've got basically the finished compost. Yes. Here we've got the beginning. So how long does it take to get from this to that? All right. Well, it takes a various amount of time yep. depending on the season. Yep. So your composting is always more vigorous and quick during the warmer months because you've got that warmth and so that builds up inside the compost Even as well. Even though this is cold compost. Yeah, this is cold composting. <laughs> so in the winter months, it can take quite a lot longer for things to rot down. So you just have to be patient with it. But I always like to try and empty one of the pits before the next one is ready so that I'm then sort of, because what I normally do is I take the top off the next pit that's going to be well composted underneath it goes into the empty pit right uh, and then other things go on top of it and then i can start taking out the good compost in the lower parts of the pit Brilliant. so that's the way it works okay well this is amazing is it a rat magnet <laughs> Look, you do have downsides to some of these yes. things, I have to say. Yes, the occasional rodent will come in and help himself or herself to the largesse we are creating. The souffle before us. Yeah, and of course, a lot of the local bird population also make use of what's here. Okay. Being in Southern Australia, we also have the occasional foray from the possum brigade that comes in and helps themselves to bits and pieces out of the, out of the compost heap. But I sort of see that as still part of the recycling. It doesn't yeah. sort of offend or worry me particularly because all these creatures are then going to do what creatures do and they're going to, at the other end of them, create something else that will go back into the garden. So it's all a cyclical sort of thing. A wonderful cycle. Well, let's go on to the next stage or a different element, which is mulch. Yes, mulch. Let's okay. talk about mulch. Well, there are some things that you can't compost. Yes. And that's generally those things that are too coarse to rot down quickly enough in your compost heap. Yes 
to make it function. Such as? Such as tree prunings. There's often things that fall out of trees in storms and things like that. So mainly twigs and branchy stuff. Yep. If it's too big to go through this wonderful, big, incredibly powerful... Scarlet shredder. Yes, my big red shredder. If it's too big to go through that, then it becomes firewood. So that's another thing again. Yes. And then when we use the firewood in our open fire, the ash comes back out and is used in the garden. Now, tell me again, because you have mentioned this before, what is the use of ash in the garden? Right. Ash has potassium in it. That's uh, it, potassium. Yeah. And so potassium is one of those elements that help produce flowers and fruit on things. Ah. You don't use it as a mulch or as a thick layer anywhere because it's inclined to cake and therefore... Become water repellent. Yes, become water repellent. Yeah. So I sprinkle some of it on the compost heap. The rest of it I sprinkle around the garden. So I just use it as a condiment, basically. <laughs> so Like uh, cayenne pepper. That's right, exactly. Uh, but not like flour. So you're not using it as an ingredient. You're using it that way. Yes. So the bigger bits end up as firewood. The smaller twigs and things that can go through this machine, which includes things like hedge trimmings, all sorts of other things like that, yeah. goes through our shredder. And then once it's gone through the shredder, it then becomes this nice chopped up stuff. Mm. And that becomes mulch, which we can use either on our paths or on our garden beds to keep the weeds down. Right. Now, I find our shredding through this machine tend to be fairly fine. Yeah. So they're better as garden bed covers. Yes. The stuff we bring in though, the shredded trees and, and stuff that we bring in from the tree surgeons, mm. that tends to be coarser and have a lot more wood in it. So we often use that on the paths until it rots down and then we put it back into the garden beds later. Wow, that is that is quite a process, Mr. Ryan. Yeah. So two things, with these shredders, can you adjust the size of the bits that come out, the, not, the shreds? Well, not in this one. It's sort of just, it's sort of one it size. It yeah. One size fits all. Yeah, exactly. And are these expensive? I mean... Yes. <laughs> so given the, the scale of the garden, you've got to figure out whether it's going to be worthwhile yeah. buying one. Yeah, and, and certainly there are different shredders for different size gardens. So you can buy a small shredder for a tiny garden if you feel the need. You can buy electric shredders, um, but they're not as as gutsy and powerful as something that's a petrol driven shredder, yeah. but you still have to dedicate a fair bit of time to it because it takes time to go through the shredder. So it's not the fastest thing in the world. But if I didn't do that, what am I going to do with those bits of the plant material that I can't use in other ways? True, so, and you'd have to be buying in mulch, mm. which actually brings me to my point. So I live in the inner city and our council has a green waste program. Yeah. So it accepts green waste, creates compost, and then you can order it back in yep. and I think there is the same for mulch as well in some some jurisdictions yep. in Australia mm -hmm. you can actually get free council mulch and I would hope perhaps around the world and other countries there are similar programs in similar jurisdictions with either compost and or mulch mm. so if you didn't have the capacity to this you could still get mulch well you can uh, I have some issues with council mulch I have to say because yes. you're never quite sure what's gone into it <laughs> the odd uh, cork <laughs> yeah well maybe well I have had truckloads of council mulch before and bits of plastic and other things come ah. out of it that have found their way into the process. I mean, it's not yeah. the end of the world, but nonetheless, uh, I quite like the idea that I'm getting tree shreddings from tree surgeons, so I know basically what's there, yeah. or I'm creating my own, and I, of course, know what ingredients have gone into my mulch if it's been my own plant material. True. So I, I prefer that where I can. And All right, this is what my shredder actually creates. This is the mulch that we use around our garden. So it's all of the branches and shreddings that we've created around the garden in the last few months. And we just have to make mention, they're not octopi, but they're actually garlics hanging along the back. <laughs> oh yes, yes, that's this year's crop of garlic. So I, uh, it's nice to be able to know that I practice what I preach in lots of different ways. So it hangs in, uh, in what is actually our woodshed. So we've got our garlic in here, our shredder in here, and all of the spare wood that I've cut from around the garden that will be burnt next winter. Okay. So there you go. Now, there is a third part to your cycle of sustainability at this garden. There is. Which involves a pit. Yes. Should we go and investigate that? Uh, yes, look, this could get a little basic, but why not indeed? We are all but humans. Stephen. Yes, exactly. All Lead right. on. Okay, let's go. Which brings us to the magical subject of effluent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one of those subjects people always try and step around, so to speak. Well, literally. Yes, quite literally. We've taken our recycling to probably the highest level one can go to. Yes. We had a very dysfunctional septic system here. Mm. Smallish block heavy clay soils, no matter what we did with the installation of drains and other sundry things, yeah. 
the effluent would run to the end and bubble up. It was disgusting. Lovely. A yeah. souffle at the end of the garden. Well, it was Oof. actually a quite literal bog garden. <laughs> <laughs> so the council decided they were going to sewer our street because we weren't the only ones having that same problem. So mm. most of the town I live in was actually in the same sort of area. And so they decided they were going to sewer the area. We decided we didn't want to go down that path if we could avoid it. Yeah. So we started looking around for a system that we could use where we would keep our effluent, all our wastewater, uh, the grey, the black water, all those things that we create inside the house on our property. Yeah. So we went out and we looked for a system and we found a worm composting toilet system. Okay, now this sounds, it sounds very Prince Charles and Highgrove as well, <laughs> but at Highgrove it's a reed bed filtration system, yep. but this is worms. Now, how do the worms not drown? Well, because what happens is all of the effluent comes into here. Yeah. And then, this is a pit which we will show yeah, you. Yeah, we'll show you the pit. And it has a pump system in it. So what happens is when the water level gets up to a certain height, yeah. and it's got sort of a pad underneath it that the water mainly sits under. So mm. the worms sit above it in the effluent <laughs> and other things that go into the tank. And the pump then turns on and it pumps the water out through realm drains that run through the garden. So, and because it's an aerobic system and not an anaerobic system like the classical septic tanks are, you've got this wonderful, rich, oxygen-filled nutrient material that's basically just liquid that runs through the garden and wow. so it feeds and waters part of the garden. So we pay for water to come in, but it doesn't go out again. So it stays on board. And in Australia, particularly, but surely in other parts of the world as well, where water is such a, an issue in terms of a sustainable resource, it's so important to do everything you can. You capture the rainwater, but you also reuse the wastewater. Exactly. So we keep everything on site. And the advantages from our perspective, uh, apart from the fact that we get to use all that free nutrient and water, yeah. is that because we're not on the, on the uh, sewerage, we don't pay sewerage rates. So we yeah. it cost us around about the same to install this system as what it costs to actually connect to the sewerage. So it was revenue neutral right from word go. Yeah. And every year we don't get a bill for three hundred or four hundred dollars from the water board to pay for sewerage collection. And you are alluding to the fact you have got this large unpleasant leaf that the, the trapdoor here enables you to put things in there that perhaps mm. couldn't go into the compost bin yep. or into the mulcher. And yes. what would you put in there then? I put in uh, seeds. So if I cut the seed heads off something that I don't want to keep Spread. coming up in yeah. the garden, they go in there. Bulbs from unwanted weedy species bulbs. Or oxalis. In, or like oxalis. But also excess bulbous material. I mean... One of the things that comes home from the supermarket regularly are the green potatoes. Mm. Now, the chickens aren't going to eat those. Yeah. You can't put them in the compost because, in fact, they would shoot and grow again, yeah. unless you want another crop of potatoes. Uh, you can't eat them yourself because they've gone green. So they go down into uh, our the pit. Yeah, into the pit, and they will rot away. The worms eat them. They turn them into nutrient, and it goes through the rest of the garden. And you'd be surprised what the worms will deal with. I did a little experiment once. Yes. I had a small piece of tree fern trunk. Yeah. Now, I never waste tree fern I was going to say, because we have covered this before, that yeah. you use them to lie in your pond. I use them as um, something to grow uh, epiphytic plants in. Yeah. Uh, you could grow orchids on them. You can yes. do all sorts of things with yeah. pieces of tree fern logs. So normally I wouldn't discard anything like no. that. But I had this rush of blood one day and decided, <laughs> I wonder what will happen if I put a piece of tree fern log down into the septic tank. It disappeared. Oh! <gasps> Oh my goodness. It took a little while, but it disappeared. Wow. So the worms dealt with it. And so, you know, I put flax leaves in there, which are hard to compost down. Yeah. Perhaps bits of blackberry and things that are hard to shred. So all sorts of things end up going down in there. And that just gives the worms a slightly broader diet. It's fabulous. So we've had this system in for 10, 15 years. I can't remember exactly how long. Yeah. And the only management we've had to do in that time is the occasional issue with a burnt out pump or something like that that mm. the system itself keeps working well so it's very easy to manage because it's aerobic and not anaerobic you can lift the lid and there's no smell of sewage or I anything know. like that there isn't it's extraordinary yeah so uh, it's just an absolute win-win and i cannot understand why more people aren't going for this quite simple 
but alternative uh, way of dealing with things. I am told by the installers of this system that they can do it on a small quarter acre block. So even in suburbia, they could manage one of these systems if for whatever reason you decided you wanted to opt off the, the sewerage. But it's interesting to know these things exist and that these things are out there. And there may well be people with non-functioning septic systems that are looking for alternatives. And some of the other alternatives, like those systems where it goes through a sand pit and all that sort of thing, yeah. are all very well. But at some point or another, you've got to clean the sand out and start again. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in theory, this might be here in another 15 or 20 years without anything being done to it and keep accepting all sorts of material that will come down into the pit and be gone forever. Magic. That's what it is, Stephen. Magic. It is, isn't it? Mmm. Makona coffee. Yeah. So you mentioned coffee early on and yep. here is a spot that you have spread it. Yep. Tell me about coffee. All right. Well, coffee grounds are reasonably high in um, nitrogen, so yep. they have a fertilizer value. Yeah. There is uh, a rumor around there that it helps keep away snails. I've yet to have it proven. I have heard that. Yep. But so I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't seem to have much impact on my snails. Yep. <laughs> but I, use, I sprinkle it around. I'll sometimes sprinkle some onto the compost heap just as another component because the bigger diversity you can put in, generally speaking, the better compost you end up with at the end of the day. Yes. But most of the time I just sprinkle it around on top of the mulch it helps hold open mulches on the ground so if you've got something that's made of mainly unrotted leaves or something like that the coffee will bind everything together a little bit and stop it from blowing away when you have a windy sort of day yeah but otherwise I just use it as another little added something and I'm also using an organic material that would otherwise probably have ended up in landfill another condiment and so again this is based on a relationship with the local yeah, local cafe. cafe. Yep. Mm. So uh, they have some rubbish bins out the back of the cafe that they put all their coffee grounds into. And about once a week, I go in, collect the rubbish bins, bring them home, empty them, and then put the empty rubbish bins back for the, the shop so that they just keep filling them up again. So very easy for anyone anywhere to try and negotiate yeah. that with a local cafe. And... <laughs> The aroma, it's not overwhelming, but it's quite lovely, the yeah. gentle smell of coffee. Yeah, I don't mind it at all. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of part of my existence here, really. All right, now, how do the chickens and the ducks fit into this grand scheme, Mr. Ryan? All right, as I mentioned when I was talking about the actual composting bit in the yes. compost bins, which are just over there, some of the scraps that come home from the supermarket and certainly some of our own kitchen scraps they go into the run where the chickens and ducks live. Uh, there's a la orange, Peking, Crispy and Nugget. <laughs> they are wicked names. Yeah. Anyway. They'll never end up in those recipes. I was going to say, not alluding to their culinary future. No. <gasps> in fact, most of them have stopped laying now, so we don't even get the benefit of the eggs at the moment because they're getting too old. But they will live out their lives in comfort and they get a lot of the scraps that come in from, particularly from the supermarket. So all the, the, the lettuce and cabbage leaves, some of the fruit and things that they like to have a go at yeah uh, so it all goes into the chook run when we need to clean that out we then dig it all out and if it's semi-rotted down it might go on top of the compost heap to help inspire it to work faster yeah or if it's reasonably well rotted down it would go directly onto one of our garden beds where we want to feed up the plants for instance that we might well use it on a bed in the veggie garden where we're going to put in leafy greens uh-huh so, now what are the the dried leaves that i see on the on the floor here well at the moment we've been cleaning up one of our rock gardens which is backed by a bamboo bamboo hedge and bamboo has leaf fall that happens on a regular basis so you end up with a whole pile of leaves all over the place so we bring them in here the girls don't eat them but they're very happy to scratch through them and they start to sort of almost work like a compost tumbler because they just sort of dig it over and then they do their business in it and it becomes this lovely rich nutrient sort of fabulous stuff for the garden in due course so it's a great way to deal with this kind of tough leaves that you yeah. perhaps couldn't put on the compost heap yeah, Although I have to say I probably would put them on the compost heap, but from our perspective, our compost heap is sometimes strained beyond its capacity too. So if you can put some things in with the chickens, they can be dealing with that reasonably promptly and quickly whilst you're still filling the compost heap up with everything else. Oh, miracle. miracle. Well, Stephen, that was amazing. Uh, plaudits to you for your sustainability credentials. Everything is covered and Just nothing leaves the property that, that could be used. But certainly anything I know I can use within the property stays here. And it does so very well. Now, what we didn't cover was cardboard and newspaper. Now, I have read that you can use that as a weed suppressant. If you're creating a new bed, for example, mm. and you need to suffocate weeds, that you can actually put cardboard down with mulch on top and leave it for a season 
the cardboard ultimately rots down yeah. and you get rid of the ground weeds. True in, or false? No, it's true. Yes. In theory, it works quite well. But I have to say the issue for me with using newspaper and cardboard is it can sometimes make an impervious layer moisture can't get through. True. And I have never used it as a mulch here because you put it down and then you put some leafy material or some wood chips or something over the top of it. And invariably, bits of it stick through. So aesthetically, I find it difficult. Mm. So I don't go down that path. So I tend to use my newspaper to light my fire with the excess cardboard goes into the recycling bin i don't generally worry about keeping hold of my cardboard because yeah. i would probably create more of it than i can deal with in my compost and things they don't go down a shredder terribly well or at least not the one i've got so yeah so they hopefully go off to be uh, paper recycled well mr ryan that was amazing thank you for taking us through the stages of your sustainability and i think there is something that everyone can do no matter whether you're just gardening in pots on yep. a windowsill to a balcony, a terrace, a small garden, a courtyard, a bigger garden, a vast horticultural uh, estate. Yes, There's and I hope they do. are doing their work because that's where you can generate an awful lot of material and sometimes they just pile it up and burn it or send it away because there's a lot of extra labour involved in managing these materials. Mm. And so it's often in the, in the case of big gardens, they can actually be more profligate with <gasps> potential good things than sometimes a smaller garden will manage. Oh, well, well, we're doing our bit. Mr. Ryan, thank you so much. How could we top this? Who knows? But we will actually do the second part, which is soil, yep. at some point in the near future. Yes. But until then, you'll have to hit subscribe to know what we're up to every week and the notification bell. And we look forward to seeing you next week with another continuing adventure. Yes, we'll see you next week. See you next week. And bye for now.